What is up, my friends? My name is Kim, and if you are interested in true crime like I am, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I post two times a week, and you don't want to miss a thing. I hope you are having a fabulous day today. I am drinking some fabulous tea. The same one as last time, the Teasley Vanilla Tea. <sighs> Chef's kiss. So good. So good. But on a more serious note, I have to put a disclaimer out there on this video. This involves children, Timothy Jones Jr. and his horrific murder of his five children. Timothy Jones is a real piece of shit. He is not worth talking about, but I want to speak about Elias, Natan, Gabe, Abigail, Elaine, and Mira deserve their story to be told. If you are triggered by child cases, please click off now. This is not the case for you. I'll be back in a couple days with a new case or I have other videos that you might be interested in. But yeah, this isn't the video for you. So I would run far away from this case because this case is a heavy one. It is awful. Be warned. <laughs> Again, this video is for Abigail Elaine, who is only one years old, Gabriel, who's two years old, Natan, only six years old, Elias, seven years old, and Mira, eight years old. Let's start with the parents of the victims in this case, Timothy Jones Jr. and Amber. It was Amber Jones, but now it's Amber Kaiser. They married on June 29, 2004 and lived in Lexington, South Carolina. When Amber first met Timothy, she was drawn to him. She described him as having faith in God. He had a high intelligence, and it was exactly what she was looking for, and she was attracted to that. She also found it attractive that he was pretty accomplished for his age. They started going to church together, and they fell in love. Amber would say, Timothy truly had everything together back then. After he graduated from University of Mississippi, he went on to get a job as a computer engineer for Intel. He made a whopping $80,000 a year. Not bad for somebody just graduating college. In the beginning, Tim and I had a strong relationship, she would say. Later on, any little thing would spark an argument. It became aggressive at times, violent. She would go on to say, towards the end of our marriage, I was thinking about the best interest of my children. So Tim initially left, and when he left, he didn't go without turning off the power on Amber. Uh, Amber would say, I couldn't provide for them, and I trusted my husband. He gave me no reason to believe otherwise. She testified that he, she loved him. Not everything in the marriage was bad. Amber gives an example of their violent relationship. She said she and Tim got into an argument at Walmart. Tim was driving the car back home when the kids in the back seat, Amber in the front passenger side. During the argument, Tim steers the car towards a path of an oncoming 18-wheeler, aiming the car where the truck would hit Amber and the kids. And then at the last minute, he pulled back into his own lane. She reported this incident to law enforcement. She testified that she reported another incident with Tim where he had grabbed her by the side of her head and slammed her head until she passed out. He threw a phone at her and broke her teeth. She believes that the older two children saw some of this abuse. Some of this abuse was Tim hacking a loogie and spitting in her face. He would break hard with the car while she was pregnant so that the seat belt would tighten around her stomach. He would also tell her that he would chop her up and feed her to the pigs. 
all of these incidents that contributed to her wanting out of the marriage, she testified. She would say, when it's like a tornado and a hurricane, there's no coming down from it. On a weekly basis, they used to go to Tim's dad's house, Tim Jones Sr. They would go there and she would consider this a break. But when they moved back to South Carolina, it is she would describe as being in prison. Amber testified that the videos Tim sent to her cell phone of the kids would just crush her heart because she felt like, you know, those are my babies. And she felt like this was manipulation on Tim's part just to torture her by sending these photos of Mira and Elias just so she would be emotionally drawn back to him. She would say, I'm not going to sugarcoat things for anybody. She takes some of the blame of the breakup. What Amber would do is she would put her kids to bed and then she would head over to the neighbor's house who she was having an affair with their son. Now, the divorce record said that he was 19 years old, but in court she testified that he was 24 and she was 27. But when Timothy found out about this and what Amber was up to during the evenings, he immediately moved out of their family home. And then they would divorce October 15th of 2013. Timothy actually left her. He left the home that they had shared. Like I mentioned, he turned off the power on Amber. Amber did not have any income. She was a stay-at-home mom. She didn't have a car. She didn't have a driver's license. She didn't have anything that she felt like she could take care of the kids. And so she felt it was better that she just gave custody over to Tim of their five children. Amber ended up moving in with her boyfriend, which now is her husband. They did end up getting married. Amber would say that she thought they were co-parenting fine at the time in August of 2014, although they were ultimately with Tim most of the time. So Tim moves into his own trailer home with his kids. The neighbors would describe Tim as a very nice guy. You know, initially when he moved in, he was friendly. He seemed like he was a really good dad to his children. But then things started to change. He stopped interacting with any of the neighbors. He even stopped himself and his kids from going outside. He became very introverted and his neighbors at one point thought that him and his children had moved out entirely. From that point on, she never really saw him or the children anymore. A nurse at the kids' elementary school where some of the children went, the older children, testified in court that, that Timothy wanted to treat their oldest daughter when she got head lice by using kerosene and a heat gun to burn them off her head. The nurse was able to talk him out of this and convince him that was just not a good idea. And she then reported it to officials at the elementary school. And so then the officials ended up calling the Department of Social Services over this, DSS. Then they placed another call to Department of Social Services because Natan, the six-year-old son, came in with bruises all over his neck and arm. Over the course of three years, the Department of Social Services went to Tim's home to investigate issues at least 12 times. Social workers reported that Tim was trying to fix the issues that were investigated, which included punishing the children excessively. Tim was put on notice I'm not really sure what notice means, but he was put on notice that he could not punish the children anymore. Tim, no more, you're done, stop punishing the children. But while on a Disney vacation that they took, they ended up taking a babysitter. Tim brought his babysitter and his five children. They went to Disney. He was walking back to the hotel room and he heard the kids not listening to the babysitter. So, 
this made him mad. So what he did was two of them, he pulled down their pants and beat them with the belt. And the babysitter had to beg him to stop. This was never reported, unfortunately, but in one of the reports, they said, dad appears to be overwhelmed and is unable to maintain the home, but the children appear to be clean and groomed and appropriately dressed. The house was described by the babysitter to be dirty, like really dirty. There was one time she went over and the smell was so bad that it made her eyes water. She had to open up all the windows and doors and actually go outside just to get some relief. Tim at one point asked the same babysitter if she could homeschool the children. She was like, uh, no, I don't have the credentials to homeschool and refused. Thank you so much for refusing. Thank God she did. There should be a rule. If you are reported to Department of Social Services, CPS, or whatever you call it in your area, that you are not allowed to homeschool. Like in other cases I've covered, this just means hide and isolate the children, and it should not be allowed. In this case, the babysitter said no, but the fact that he was trying, it's not a good sign. The babysitter would say that she was worried about the kids if they were being fed, because on some days she would have to feed them oatmeal all day. And she had to feed them oatmeal because that was the only thing in the house. And if the kids were fed before their dad was to come home, the children would beg the babysitter to please do not let dad know I just ate because if he knows I just ate, he will not feed me again. Of course she agreed and she was very concerned that the kids weren't being fed. So back to Amber, Amber would meet Timothy and their five children every Saturday at a Chick-fil-A. And she was able to each week get a ride to be able to meet the kids at this Chick-fil-A. It was located right in the Lexington area. Amber would catch a ride with friends or family every weekend and then they would meet up on Saturday. On August 28th, back in 2014, Amber called Timothy on his cell phone, like she did every week so that she could coordinate their meetup. She just wanted to make sure, hey, we're meeting on Saturday, same time, same place, you know, just to confirm it to make sure that they were on the same page. Timothy picked up the phone. All she could hear was Natan uncontrollably crying in the background. Any mother being concerned, she asked Natan, what's the problem? What's going on? Natan would just, in his uncontrollable cry, say, Mom, I didn't mean to do it. He sobbed. Timothy, the dad, sounded very angry and livid. Amber heard him say, you could have killed yourself, son. Natan was so upset that he started dry heaving. This kid was under duress. Amber asked him what is going on and if he was okay. And Timothy then turned his anger to Amber, saying she always defended the children. She still had no idea what was going on or what the heck all of this commotion was and why her son was crying uncontrollably. She tried to talk to Tim. She tried to talk to Natan. But of course, Timothy just cursed her out and hung up the phone. So what happened that day when Amber called was that Timothy had caught Natan playing with an outlet in their home. Natan said he was really interested in electricity and he had ended up breaking the outlet while he played with it. Timothy flew into a complete rage. He claimed that he punished Natan by making him do a bunch of like different exercises for hours, including push-ups, sit-ups, squats. He called it PT, which physical therapy, physical training, I'm, he called it PT. Um, we talked about when you picked your children up Thursday, which would have been um, August 28th. You picked them up from school that day and something happened that night. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 
All right, can, can you walk us through what happened? I questioned the town about the four outlets that he blew. After a series of not getting any favorable responses out of him, I tried to use more harsh measures to just try to get out of him what was going on because I didn't know what he was doing. I seen four destroyed outlets. Uh, is it for me, him? Was he curious? I just didn't know what was going on and I was trying to make sense of it. I worked him too hard or maybe it was a combination of the electricity. I know electricity takes electrolytes out of your body. Uh, something happened. Mm -hmm. It was out of the ordinary and he wouldn't tell me. If I would have known it, I mean, I, I would have got it medical help and whatnot, but I don't know what he did and he didn't tell me. I didn't see any burn marks on his body, so that's why I didn't rush him to the hospital. So after the fact, he, he was deceased. And then what, what happened to him? What, how, how did he get deceased? What, what did you do? I sent him to bed after I worked him real hard because he wouldn't answer me. And, and what, what do you mean by working him too hard? I just PT'd his ass till he couldn't handle it. So I had to crack him on butt a couple times to get something out of him to tell me what was he doing. Right. What's his motive? And when you're saying PT, and what, what are we talking about? Squats and push-ups. Squats, push-ups. How, how long were you having them PT? I'm PT like an hour. Like I said, there's nothing out of the ordinary. Those kids would do insanity with and, me. We had fun doing it. And where did he go from, you're doing this, where in the house? Where are you PT? This was in the living room, and then I finally got tired of him and sent him to bed. Okay. Tired to bed. You're not telling me the truth. I can't help you. Go to bed, man. You're wasting everybody's time. And then, and then you, you find out what? come back and find out that he's deceased. And when I find out he's deceased, then the shit is the fan and all. What is interesting is that Timothy himself couldn't pass his PT in military, but he expected his six-year-old son to do it for hours. Timothy claimed that Natan wouldn't tell him why he did it. So when he gave up on him, telling him what and why he was doing what he was doing, he sent Natan to bed. Just go to bed. When he went in to check on Natan later in the evening, Timothy claimed he simply found him dead in his room. Tim would state at this point he felt like, I am fucked, I've ruined my life, his words. Not po my poor son, my beautiful boy, Natan's life is gone. No, Timothy's life is fucked. Tim only cared about Tim. Timothy then claimed he heard voices inside his head that he had to kill all of the other children after he found Natan. So you're, you're not sure what the autopsy will show for, for Natan? I don't know what it's going to show. I don't know. What actually was it? I don't know what his actual cause of death was. That's just the point. I didn't want to go. I was afraid I was going to just get myself locked up. Yeah. In court, the pathologist said that Natan had definitely died to some type of violence. However, she wasn't sure exactly what it was he did to murder his son. The bodies were so decomposed to be able to determine a cause of death. Okay, so let's back up. So he finds he finds Natan dead in his bed. So his natural reaction was it's it's 1 a.m. in the morning. Timothy thought, I need to go get some smokes. He had ran out of cigarettes, so he loaded his oldest child Mira Gracie, eight years old, into his Cadillac Escalade, and he drove to a nearby convenience store for cigarettes. And the only reason I believe, and the prosecutor believes, that he brought Mira with him is because she was old enough to know what was going on. She was old enough to call for help. But back at home, while he's running for his smokes, he leaves his seven-year-old child, Elias, waiting in terror next to the body of his dead brother, Natan, for his father's return. The two youngest children, Gabe, who was only two years old, and Abigail Elaine, who was only one years old, were luckily still sleeping. The act itself is horrible, but for me, it's the in-between what these kids went through, in my mind, that is the worst because these 
the older children were aware of what was going on, one by one. Instead of calling police to tell them that Natan accidentally died or he accidentally killed him, I we don't know what happened that day. No, he didn't do that. He ends up returning back to the home after buying his cigarettes and he strangled his remaining children. He strangled first seven-year-old Elias, then eight-year-old Mira Grace that had just gone to the store with him. He did this with his hands. And the younger two, two two-year-old Gabe and one-year-old Abigail Elaine, he had to use a belt because his hands were too big. Only a monster, a complete monster, could do this. I absolutely hate this man. Let's talk about the kids and what was said about them at their funeral. There was Mira Gracie, only eight years old, who called her long chestnut brown hair her Rapunzel hair. In a photo, she was shown with her, just her little itty bitty self sitting in a restaurant table, and she's just beaming at the photographer proudly displaying her missing front tooth. Elias, seven years old, who loved the outdoors. There was a photo of him as well. It was in the same restaurant or at a restaurant, wearing a just a little miniature tie with a pile of waffles and french fries in the background. Elias once surprised his first grade classmates by pulling a live turtle out of his pocket during share time. He had found the turtle the day before and slept with it overnight. Natan, only six years old, who called himself Tater and loved to fish with his big brother Elias. The first grader went nowhere without Charlie Moose, his favorite stuffed animal. He loved the movie Toy Story and had a Woody doll he cherished as well. His mom would say, I miss his voice a lot. I miss his freckles on his nose. Then we have sweet-natured Gabriel, only two years old, named from the archangel, love books and care bears. And lastly, the baby of the family, Abigail Elaine, one years old, who insisted on her juice and blanket. She was thrilled at giving high fives and kisses. They love going to the park, they love swimming, they love chocolate chip cookies. They were innocent children. Tim not wanting to look at them, he loads the five lifeless children wrapped in sheets and put them in the middle row seats of his Escalade. He stays at the house for a couple of days with his kids in the car. Tim gives all of his stuff inside of his house to the neighbors. Tim then informs his neighbors he is moving out of state with the children for a fresh start. Meantime, Amber, the mother, didn't know any of this is going on, of course. The last she had heard was a crying voice from Natan, and she wouldn't know that that was the last time she would ever hear Natan's voice again. She tried calling back several times. She left voicemails. She didn't hear from Timothy for days. Days went by, no sign of Timothy or any of the children. On September 3rd, Amber called the police to report her children missing. It wasn't unusual for her not to hear from Tim, but when Amber found out that the children had missed several days of school, that is when the red flags went up for Amber and she knew something was wrong. That Saturday rolled around the day that they always met at Chick-fil-A. It was September 6, 2014. Amber decided to go to this Chick-fil-A to see if maybe Tim would show up like he was supposed to. And she had the police there with her to watch and see if he ever showed up. Amber sat in that booth and she waited and waited and waited. No, Timothy. He did not show up. Their kids never showed up. Amber had already suspected something was terribly wrong, and now there was no doubt in her mind something 
was really wrong. So the authorities went to speak to Timothy's neighbors, and the neighbors would tell the authorities that Tim had mentioned he was taking the kids to live in an, another state. Authorities weren't able to put out an Amber Alert for the children because Timothy was the legal guardian of these children. It didn't stop them from launching a huge search to find him and the children. So shortly after Timothy failed to show up at the Chick-fil-A as he was supposed to, he showed up at a Mississippi, now they're from South Carolina, he's in Mississippi at a DUI checkpoint. But he's alone. No children. No children were found in that car. Authorities say he rolled up to the checkpoint in his Cadillac Escalade high as a kite. Timothy was using synthetic marijuana. It was called Scooby Snacks. His SUV had blood inside of it along with children's clothes, cleaning supplies. There were no signs of any children. They also uncovered several notes Timothy had written about chopping bodies up. One of the officers on the scene later told the courtroom that inside his SUV, it smelled like something you would never believe. He described it as a stench of death in the air. Their bodies in the vehicle. Yes. Between then and the time you come with, uh, in contact with the officer, and that would be Friday on September 5th, so we have over a week's time that has passed by. Your children are still still in the vehicle. Is that correct? What date? Friday. When you you have contact yeah, with the law. Yeah, so the next Saturday was yeah. Okay, so they're in the vehicle the whole time. What's kind of happening in the vehicle? As far as how does it smell in there? Stinks like shit. What's happening with the children? You were telling me before. I just I, the blood was probably just coming out of their bodies because I just left them in there, and mm -hmm. I believe that. Well, as far as I know, I think when your body dies, you well, blood and water separate. I think that's. After running his license plate, they were able to connect Timothy to Amber's missing persons report. Officers were able to talk. Timothy into taking them where the children were. What he had done, as we now know, is he packed their bodies into his SUV and he drove around for over a week through different states. He had stopped and purchased some supplies to get rid of evidence. He bought items from Walmart, a jab saw, if I'm saying that right, a multi-saw, muriatic acid, a five gallon bucket, dust mask, and goggles. Oh yeah, and a Gatorade, because he's probably gonna get thirsty. His ex-wife Amber stated that Tim was very hard on Natan, the six-year-old. And she, at times, had to protect Natan from Tim. And wouldn't you know it, he was the first child and the only child that Tim tried to dismember. Yes, he tried to dismember his children. He states he stopped after Natan and that he just couldn't do that to his children. How did you start, Tim? I cannot understand. My brain literally hurts. Their bodies were very much decomposed. Timothy decides the, to put them into garbage bags. Tim drove around with them for a week. He then came across the hilltop where he decided to leave the five children on the side of the road. He said there was no point hiding them. So he just put them on the side of the road. He had some plans written out in his car of some ways that he was gonna get rid of evidence of the children as well as escape plans. He had his passport, a note that said MB, which was later suggested that that was the Mexican border. He looked up countries where they don't extradite. How could someone kill their five children? Jones's defense attorneys argued that he is poisoned fruit of a toxic family tree. 
rotted by severe mental illness, drug abuse, alcoholism, incest, multiple suicides, child abuse, and parental abandonment. Demonetized for sure after all that. Gripped by insane delusions and fueled by synthetic marijuana, Jones fell apart under the stress of a broken marriage and the demands of caring for five young children. More than half a dozen mental health experts assessed Timothy. Their findings range from insane to being mentally troubled but faking extreme symptoms. One court-appointed psychiatrist testified, although Timothy claimed to hear voices, they were probably his own anxious thoughts, if anything. The defense attorney summed up his client in these terms, killing children you love is insane. I agree. According to Timothy, he told police that his children were going to kill him and chop him up and feed him to the dogs. Or maybe Jones was just an evil killer who plotted out the murders, made plans to burn his children's bodies and evade the law for more than a week, as the 11th Circuit solicitor Rick Hubbard said. Hubbard told the jury he didn't believe Jones' story that he killed little Natan by accident, forcing the child to do extreme exercises until he died. Instead, Hubbard said Jones killed Natan in a white-hot rage and ripped up his favorite Woody doll, which later authorities did find that, in shreds. The jury found him guilty and not insane. He was sentenced to death. Good riddance. In my own opinion, this type of evil should never walk the earth, in prison or otherwise. He was a cold and callous man who was only interested in saving himself, narcissistic to the core. He stated that he couldn't take his own life because it is an unforgivable sin. I have no words for this man. This case was extremely difficult to research. It's one thing to watch a video, but understanding and putting yourself in the mind of these victims, the fear, the time in between events, the abuse, the pain they must have felt, it consumes me. Although I wish I had a time machine and I could go back in time and save these babies, that doesn't exist. The only thing I can do is share the stories of Elias, Natan, Gabe, Abigail Elaine, and Mira Gracie. To one, know that these children's lives mattered. And number two, spread awareness. If you see something, say something. CPS or whatever they're called in your area, do not take kids away willy-nilly. You can tell them you don't want to get involved, but they need to be checked on and tell them, this is what I saw. I don't want to get involved. Easy peasy. And if you're on the fence and you don't know whether you want to call or not, Think of this case. No one saw this coming for Tim. He was said by some to be a good dad. There were witnesses that could have called in this case. I'm not going to call out any names or point fingers because I don't want to come across as if it's their fault that other people are to blame for Timothy's actions because they're not. But if they would have called, who knows if I'd even be covering this case today. So please, I urge you, if you see something, say something. All right, this was a heavy one, you guys. If you made it to the end, you guys are definitely rock stars, and I love you to death. Hug your babies. There are more true crime videos in my Captured Killers playlist if you'd like to check those out. But either way, stay safe, my loves. I'll see you in my next one. Bye.